Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Krylik. Uh, today is September 23rd, 2021. Um, our program this evening, uh, Philo T. Farnsworth, uh, is going to be presented uh, by Coxie Toogood. Uh, Coxie is a member of the Board of Directors uh, of the Springfield Township Historical Society, and she was a uh, historian uh, with the National Park Service based in Independence Park for, for many years. Um, and we're, we're very happy to have her uh, uh, present this evening on Philo T. Farnsworth. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Coxie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. So good evening, everyone. I am speaking on Philo Farnsworth because the Chestnut Hill Conservancy introduced him to me because I had volunteered to um, help them out after I retired, which I recently did. And in fact, they said, well, how about Philo T. Farnsworth? Who had ever heard of Philo T. Farnsworth? I certainly had not. And I sort of canvassed my friends and nobody had heard of him. So, um, then I discovered that there is an actual Pennsylvania Historical Commission sign in Winmore that marks where his studio was when he was in Philadelphia. And that's why we're talking about him. He came to Philadelphia. But he started his life in um, Utah in a little town called, a little community called Indian Creek in a log cabin. And his parents were um, Mormon. His grandfather had been sent by Brigham Young as a pioneer to open up the West. And they lived in this log cabin until he was 11 with no electricity, no water, no plumbing. And it was very rudimentary and a simple farming life. He had very little resources and no books to read. When he was 11, they moved to near to Rigby, Idaho in the Snake River Valley. And there he was in a farmhouse that had electricity and that absolutely Prompted, prompted his curiosity and his genius. He found in the attic piles of magazines on electricity and proceeded to devour them. And soon enough, he was doing experiments and thinking about it all the time. And the family story goes that at 14, he actually came up with the concept of electrical TV by looking at the straight lines that the plow made in the ground. And he was thinking that electrons could be sent in straight lines and recreated in a receiver to make a picture. You make it into lines and then reconstitute it with the electrons. And already TV had been experimented with, but it was all mechanical and had to be done by hand. And this he knew would not work. And he was convinced that electrical TV would be the answer and would be a wonderful way to help the world come together and be more peaceful and educate people and end wars. He was very idealistic even as a boy. He came up with this idea and presented it in high school to his chemistry teacher, John Tolman. John Tolman was so impressed that he kept this diagram and never forgot Farnsworth. And that was very lucky for Farnsworth because later he had the diagram to prove and help prove that he had had the original patent for his ideas. As a young man, though, he was very ambitious. He tried always to educate himself 
and take care of his family. His father died when he was 18. They had moved to Provo to be closer to an educational, Provo, Utah, to be closer to an educational center. And his ambition was to go to college. But in order to do so, because there was no money um, and his father had died, he took a correspondence course and got a license to be an electrical engineer and began to take jobs and took a little, a few classes at Brigham Young University, but really couldn't afford to do it. So eventually he went and got another job, got a job with George Everson and Les Correll, Correll who were California fundraisers in Provo at the time. And they hired him to do some survey work. And he convinced them by their interest in him. He was so dynamic, a young man. He was all of 18 years old, that he was someone they would like to put their earnings, their savings into. And they decided to back his enterprise, his idea. But the condition was that he had to go to California and set up his lab there. So Philo immediately went to his fiance, Edna, or otherwise known as Pem Gardner, and married her within the next three days. And off they went on the train to California. He was always very close with his family. And so he brought them in to help with the setting up the lab in California. And this shows him standing with Agnes, uh, which was his sister on the right, and Cliff Gardner, his best friend and brother to Emma or Pam. Everybody had to work hard to get the lab together. It was started from scratch and they even had to figure out the design of the tubes that they were gonna use and everyone pitched in and it was quite an intense time. And once they did that, they got affirmation from Stanford University scientists, one of whom thought he was a genius. And with that kind of backing, they went to this uh, vice president of Crocker Bank in San Francisco, a friend of George Everson's and asked for his support. And he decided that he would put his money behind the enterprise. In September 27, 1927, the team actually came out with the first all electric television picture. It was just a, a line and it was on a very small screen, but it was historic moment. And it, again, he was using friends and family um, to work in the lab. The image dissectors were one of his creation and an important part of making the television um, bring the electrons into a picture. In 1928, he got wonderful press in the San Francisco Chronicle where he was called a young genius and a revolutionary television producer. And this really piqued the interest of people across the country. And he continued to demonstrate to try to stir up publicity and win some more stockholders in his company. David Sarnoff, the president of RCA, Radio Corporation of America, became very interested in television. RCA was one of the bigger corporations in the country at the time. And he decided that he would get into the business. 
And so he hired a recent immigrant from Russia, Vladimir Zvorkin, who had a PhD in electrical engineering. Zvorkin had come from Westinghouse. And after he hired him, he sent Zvorkin out to be a guest at the Farnworth, Farnsworth Labs and to check it out and see what was going on. And Zorkin stayed for three long days and sent back apparently a telegram of 700 words explaining what the um, equipment was like and in the lab. And when he came back, of course, he reproduced what he saw. Um, so began the competition. But the next year, um, Sarnoff himself came in 1931 and um, actually offered $100,000 for um, Farnsworth to sell his patent, which he had put in in 1930. And come join RCA, but that was not Farnsworth's dream. His dream was to be an inventor and to earn his way through his patents and he wasn't going to give up his patents. Well, that led him to um, go east himself, Farnsworth, and he, got a job and took his lab with him to Philco in Philadelphia. And they began a family and everything was going very well. Philco actually was on the Delaware opposite the RCA lab, TV lab in New Jersey. And they were he worked for Philco for a couple of years and actually set up a temporary um, TV station for them. But in 1932, it all came to an end for, in part because RCA was really pressuring Philco and RCA held the patent for the um, radio. So Philco was kind of being pressed to get rid of um, Farnsworth. Also, little Kenny, pictured on the left here, died in March of 1932, and Philco would not let uh, Philo go with Pem back to Salt Lake City to bury their son. They said they couldn't afford him to go away, and so he was very embittered by that. By the end of 1932, he was gone. Okay. Okay, so after 1932, it he decided to go into business for himself. He still had George Everson backing him and his wonderful lab team who really thought he was a genius and he was very good to work with, came with him and they set up at 127 Mermaid Lane in Chestnut Hill. You had to go up the driveway to the garages in the back and they set up the lab upstairs and the lab team worked up there and possibly some of them lived up there. He hired some local assistants, including jo Joseph Spallone, who was a very talented carpenter and metal worker who lived just down the street at 54 Mermaid Lane. George Everson continued to send people down from New York who might be potential stockholders or investors in the company. And um, he would bring out the television and give them a demonstration. The Biggest break was in 1934, when the Franklin Institute invited Farnsworth to come display his television at their brand new Franklin Institute building on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. The press 
really showed him up very well. And it was a started out as a week demonstration, week long demonstration, ended up being two weeks because it was so popular. People came and packed the auditorium. 200 scientists were there on the opening day. There were lines that went all the way around the block. They continued to show, de to demonstrate in the auditorium sometimes till 11 at night. They had vaudeville shows. They had football t players. They had um, people being filmed as they came into the Franklin Institute. Everybody was just so thrilled and fascinated by this experience. And it really did wonders for his press. One of the great supporters for Farnsworth was the Frank Turner family from San Francisco. And here his Frank Turner's son Ski, they called him Ski, um, came to Philadelphia, joined the family, actually lived with the Farnsworths, and um, worked in the lab and was just a, a wonderful part of the family. The Farnsworths lived in at least two locations during their time in Philadelphia. One was 143 Durham Street in Mount Airy, which was in the 1935-36 city directory. Um, but he also, in 1935, in October of 1935, moved to Cresham Valley Road. And we don't know which house he lived in in this 1939 photo of him with his mother really doesn't reveal anything. A 1938 Montgomery County Atlas does indicate that at least 12 houses were on Crescent Valley Road that decade. But again, we do not know anything other than the fact that it was a very lovely setting and that he was within an easy walk to his lab on Mermaid Lane. The Turner family also helped fulfill his dream to have a studio, a television studio, which was completed in 1936 at 1220 Mermaid Lane. It looks like the whole lab crew showed up for possibly the dedication of the building that year. And the tower still stands there over the historical marker, reminding us that Farnsworth's studio was on the site. In 1936, after the studio opened and Farnsworth was really hungry to keep working in the studio, he got a call from um, the Bairn Studios in. Um, London, Baird, Baird Studios, excuse me, in London, asking for him to help demonstrate the, um, the equipment that he had in 1934 sold the license to, to Baird Studio. Baird had been making mechanical TV, TVs in London, but um, was thoroughly convinced when he saw the demonstration in 1934. So in 1936, uh, Philo decided that this was the perfect opportunity to at last have their honeymoon, because after 10 years, they could finally enjoy a little relaxation. So after they visited Baird and fixed the problem there, they went off to the Riviera and tried to relax, but they didn't have much time because they then found out that the Baird Studios had completely been burned to the ground. So they returned to London and found it in ashes and Philo decided he would go on to the Furnace AG um, company 
in Germany, where he had also sold a license. They were allies of Baird and see if he could collect some royalties there. The minute they got to Berlin, they realized they were in trouble. Hitler was on the rise and he was cutting off any assets leaving the country. And when they tried to leave, three of their exit permits were denied. Finally, one of the company agents um, helped them onto a train that went to the coast and they got a ship home. Well, no sooner did they get home that they found out that McGarger had come east and fired the entire lab staff and put in new hires. Farnsworth tried to fix what he could, but it was a very dispiriting thing to happen. In 1938, Farnsworth took his family to Maine for a vacation. He was pretty burnt out, had started drinking, needed some time off, and he had a chance to be with his boys. He actually went to visit George Everson's um, farm, Haley Farm, and bought it. It was not in very good shape, but he decided he wanted to buy it, and he threw himself into bringing it back. But the next year, Sarnoff entered the New York World Fair for RCA and announced that RCA was the first in TV. A very demoralizing thing because Farnsworth had not entered the New York Fair and was not getting the press that RCA was. Even so, the next month, Philo was named one of the top 10 um, young men of 1939 in America by biographer Derwood Howes. And that was maybe some consolation, but 1939 was a tough year. They just, the company decided to shift gears and go into the manufacture of radios and televisions, and they moved the works out of Philadelphia to Fort Wayne and Marion, Idaho. And um, the Farnsworths followed them out there in the fall of 1939. But as World War II came on, I forgot to mention earlier that, uh, of course, Farnsworth's money problems had a lot to do with the Depression, which came upon us in 1929. So all through the 30s, everybody was scrambling for um, their livelihoods. But in um, 1942, Farnsworth moved to Maine and took a leave of absence from his company. And he built a small two-story lab and invited his loyal lab technicians, many of whom came, to work with him there. Um, because the war effort was on, that he created a um, Farnsworth Wood Company and sold wooden crates for ammunition to the war, war effort, for the war effort. But off and on during these years, in the 1940s, his health was really declining. He often went to Boston for care and he had hernia problems, he was hospitalized, and um, he, his drinking began to pick up. So he was definitely on a decline. In 1957, after he had returned to Fort Wayne in the late 40s, he accepted an invitation to um, I've got a secret, Gary Moore's I've got a secret. None of the panel recognized who he was, even though he was introduced as an inventor. 
in 19, this is actually the Apollo um, missile launching on, on the moon and um, Neil Armstrong. And in 1967, they had moved back to their home, their Mormon roots and given up Fort Wayne altogether after several years at they had so, he had sold the company in 1949 to IT&T and worked for them for several years on um, nuclear fusion, which again, he thought idealistically would be a world saver and um, help with pollution in all sorts of other ways. But that didn't really materialize and he didn't get as much support as he needed. And eventually he just began to run out of money and they moved back to Salt Lake City and um, kind of renewed their roots. But while he was watching television and watching Neil Armstrong, he was able to say to Pem, this makes it all worth it because in fact, the camera work for that mission was Farnsworth's creation. In 1971 at 65, Farnsworth finally just gave up the ghost. He had really had so many years of poor health and he just, left this earth and left Pam devastated. She became determined almost in a spiritual way to recreate and restore her husband's legacy. She worked for many years with her son, Ken, to pull together material. And then in 19, 99 produced Distant Vision, the biography of her husband. And it emphasized his visionary, his Mormon beliefs, not his Mormon beliefs, but his background and uh, his determination to get things done. And it's a very interesting read. She also was able to get a commemorative stamp for Philo T. Farnsworth in 1983. It was one of four different um, inventors of, in American history. Also, she pushed for statues. There is now a statue in the US Capitol Hall of Fame and a statue in the Capitol of Salt Lake City of Farnsworth. Another author, Donald Godfrey, um, published a book in 2001 relating Philo's achievements and life career. And Godfrey was well qualified being a PhD at the Arizona and a professor at Arizona State University. He worked in many, many archives and um, had 60 pages of endnotes. And finally, there was in 1997, a uh, PBS American Experience special on Farnsworth and it benefited from interviews with Farnsworth's sons, his wife, Pem, and um, surviving lab technicians. David McCullough, historian of American history, um, gave the introduction and eloquently saw him as an American original, something like Franklin and Edison, who had 
humble beginnings and that no one knew and who rose to world status as scientists. McCullough reminds us that Farnsworth was lost to history, but by telling his story, perhaps his genius will be recognized in the future. That is the end of my story. Okay, thank you, Coxie. Okay, so um, so what I'd like to do is uh, invite uh, anybody that has any questions for Coxie um, to unmute yourself and, uh, and, and feel free to ask your questions. Um, and while you're doing that, uh, Coxie, is there um, is there a repository of the tubes or the the artifacts from from the early days of his work? I imagine there is. It's probably in Salt Lake City, um, but I'm not sure because mostly I was sort of paying attention to the written word, and I'm not sure if there. I, I, I don't never actually came across any mention of a Farnsworth Museum, but I'm really kind of struck by um, Dolores's school story that they're featuring Farnsworth in a play. I mean, because honestly, most people have never heard of him. So it's quite wonderful to hear. Mm -hmm. um, Christine Smith asks, uh, how long did Farnsworth live in the Chestnut Hill, Winmore area? From 1931 to 1939, he moved to Fort Wayne um, in 1939 when the whole company moved and they closed the studio. So the studio um, was only open for three years. Of course, there wasn't much television in those years that it was open. There were only a handful of people who could have a television in their home and mostly it was the staff of the Farnsworth, uh, and that's just the way it was. And RCA in the 40s began to really build up their production, but not until after the war. Nobody could produce anything until the war was over. Okay. Well, if anybody has any other questions, you can you can type them in the uh, in the chat or um, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, if not, um, Coxie, thank you very much for uh, for your presentation this evening. Um, hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, and uh, um, thanks, thanks for joining us this evening, everybody. Um, and have a uh, a good evening. Thank you, Scott.